Welcome to French Revolution Part 2. Today we're going to storm the Bastille. Eh, at this time I'm sitting behind my desk because the artifacts I'm going to show you, you'll have to wait until we knock the Bastille off, and then I'll put the video in for that. But I am in the section of my library that has all of my books on the French Revolution. So let's get started and knock that Bastille off. In this section, we will pick up where we left off, which will be January of 1789. We'll go through the progression, getting to the Estates General, and then the eruption, which ultimately leads to the fall of the Bastille. After the collapse of the Bastille, then we'll see what else the French Revolution did afterwards, all the way up till 1790. After Louis XVI called for the Estates of General, the people of France began voting for their representative, and they were very excited. Things were going to get better. Then in January 1789, Abbe Sayez, and you're going to hear that name a lot because he is the Thomas Jefferson of the French Revolution. He will write most of the constitutions. He wrote a pamphlet called What is the Third Estate? Now, if you're in my 134 class, you had an excerpt from this that you were supposed to do an assignment. So hopefully it's done at this particular point. And in this, he blows everything up. He talks about how worthless the first estate and particularly the second estate, the nobles, were. That everything that was important was done by the third estate. And he also believed that the estates general, general would fail because the nobles and the high clergy would see to it. So he's talking about some things that are possibly going to take place. Then on May the 5th, finally, the Estates General meets and chaos. The nobles would not allow themselves to go in the same doors that the Third Estate would go in. So there's this separation there. By the way, they're meeting at Versailles. And then it begins to bog down over several issues. And one of those will be, as Abby Say has said, how to vote. But things looked like they were improving. May the 20th, the clergy renounced their financial privileges, which says they are willing to be taxed. And on May the 23rd, the nobles said they would renounce their financial privileges. Hmm, sounds good. But what are they asking for? At this point, the king is a little distracted. As you see on June the 4th, the Dauphin has died. His One of his sons dies. And that's not going to help. And the other issue is that if Louis had had a plan, he could have utilized this tension between the third estate and the other two estates to perhaps put in a moderate point of view. But he was counting on this group of people making everything correct. Now, if you look at the chart for the estates general, this is the way it normally would be constituted. At the first estate, the clergy would have 300 seats. They represented 100,000 people. The second estate, the nobility, 400,000 people in, the, in France would get 300 seats or votes. And the third estate, the rest of the population, 22,500,000 would get 300 votes. So you can see if you voted by numbers under the old system, first and second estate would win. If you voted by class, one vote for each estate, the first and second estates would win. So it's a waste of time, as Abby Sayez said, for the third estate. In reality, they made some manipulations. They made a few adjustments. So you see the actual estates general on May the 5th, the first estate had 300 seats. The second estates had 291 seats. And they gave the third estate 610 seats. So in reality, if you voted by numbers, the third estate would win all the time. But the idea was they were, that's not the way it was going to work. So if you look at the voting problem, problems of voting were debated before. The first one is voting by order. Majority of each estate carried that estate. Under the systems, only three votes were counted. And then two, voting by numbers, all estate members voted and would be totaled and the largest numbers would win. Now, one of the things that is crucial here is the clergy, because remember, the clergy has high clergy and low clergy, and there are a significant representation. It's almost split 50-50. So it doesn't take a whole lot of the cardinals and bishops to switch to throw that vote out of whack. So that's what's going to happen at this point. The Estates General is just going to grind to a halt over this voting problem. Remember on May the 20th when the clergy renounced their financial privileges and then on May the 23rd, the nobles did the same thing and I suggested what did they want? Well, here's what they wanted. Here's the aims of the nobles. And it looks pretty good. 
demand constitutional government. All right, they want the king, they want to reduce his power, they want a constitutional government, kind of like England. They would then guarantee personal liberty for everyone. They would provide and guarantee for free speech and a free press. They would allow for freedom of arbitrary arrest and confinement, so the letters to cachet would disappear. In return, they were to become the most powerful political element in France. They wanted to rule by using the Estates General, as the nobles in England ruled through Parliament. Well, what does the Third Estate think of this? The Third Estate's aim is simple. Avoid at all costs what the nobles want. In other words, don't give them power. We now have the polarization of the Estates General. In early June, after the funeral for the Dauphin, things really become tense at the Estates General. The nobles are concerned that the Third Estate is going to do something. They try to talk Louis into shutting everything down. Louis doesn't know what to do. He doesn't have a plan. So then on June the 17th, the Third Estate makes the first move. They adopt the title of National Assembly. In other words, they're going to claim that they represent all the people of France. Well, they have, certainly do represent the majority of the people of France, but they really need to make it work some representatives of each of the other two estates. So on June the 19th, the majority of the clergy voted to join the third estate. Now that legitimizes, once again, that's one step closer to legitimizing that it is indeed the National Assembly. Then we have on June the 20th, the famous tennis court oath. The tennis court oath, as depicted here, this is a close-up of it. The original is in the museum, the Carvalet. What it shows is that the king did indeed lock up all the meeting places, what they thought all the rooms that were big enough for the assembly to meet, trying to thwart the National Assembly from getting together. But they left the tennis courts alone. So in this picture, you see a man standing on a table. That's Abbe Sayez. And he has written the tennis court oath, which we'll look at in a, little, a few minutes. Now, in front of him, there's a there are two men. There's a member of the clergy, and they convinced one noble to switch and join up. So when those two shake hands, it's the equivalent of saying that all the three states of France are represented, and the majority of the people who do all of the work control it. They're taking this oath, and anybody can say they can take the oath. And then, oh, I, I, I really didn't. No, no, you had us take the oath. There's a group taking, which you see here depicted. But that table in front of where Abbe Say is standing is where everyone comes in, recites the oath, and signs it. So that if this all falls apart, they're not going to be able to escape. Now here's the actual tennis court oath. As you can see, it's, it's not very difficult. The National Assembly, considering that since it has been called to decide the constitution of the realm to achieve the regeneration of public order, and to maintain the true principles of the monarchy, nothing can prevent it from continuing in deliberations in whatever place it may be forced to establish itself, and that wherever indeed its members are assembled, there is the National Assembly. Resolved that all the members of this assembly shall immediately take a solemn oath never to separate and to reassemble wherever the circumstances demand until the constitution of the realm has been established and secured on solid foundations, and that the said oath having been taken, all of its members, each individually, shall confirm by their signature this unshakable resolution." So the tennis court oath says, wherever we have to go, we're going to meet, we're going to write this constitution. Oh, now this really triggers a mess. The nobles are, are going crazy. Louis is concerned about what he should do. And his next, let's just say his next decision is a disaster. On June the 26th, Louis orders troops to begin concentrating around Paris. Well, who he chooses is important. The French have a regular army, and they also have a king's royal army, which is the Swiss Guard. And the Swiss Guard are known to do whatever the king deems necessary. If you're going to get beaten up in a, in a crowd, the Swiss Guard are going to do it. Concentrating the troops around Paris and concentrating the troops around Versailles is a signal to the people of Paris that this National Assembly is in trouble, and they need to be able to defend it. June the 27th, he then orders the clergy and the nobility to join the Third Estate. On July the 9th, the National Assembly declares itself a new name, the Constituent Assembly. 
which means they now do indeed represent all of the estates since they've all been added to the National Assembly. This sets the stage for the storming of the Bastille. On July the 12th, rioting began in Paris as people began looking for weapons so that they could defend the National Assembly against the Swiss Guard or whatever the nobles were going to do. So they began going to various locations in Paris, and one of them is the Anvalide. This is an aerial view of the Anvalide. It was a hospital that had been built by Louis XIV to house soldiers who had been wounded and injured in wars that no one could take care of. It was also an armory. So this huge crowd of people, probably almost 60,000, were gathered in its parade, gra parade grounds. They confronted the governor general, who was General Sombarel, and they said they wanted weapons. They sent a delegation of people in. It was like a huge mob. And he said he sympathized with them, but he could didn't have orders, and he would have to wait for orders. So he was able to appease the people. Now, you have to remember that every officer in the French army, and he's French army at this time, it's not Swiss Guard. They're all nobles. Well, he's well respected by his uh, soldiers that he has there, the pensioners. After the, after the mob left, he then told his men to start dismantling as many rifles as they possibly could. Now, there were 32,000 muskets at the Envolide. They didn't have much gunpowder. Gunpowder is usually stored in another location. However, in the six hours that the men had to deal with the weapons... Only 20 of them had been neutralized. And all you really needed to do was remove the hammer bolt and it's it's done. But they only managed to do 20 of them. At any rate, he sent out for, you know, he told the people that he needed reinforcements and he didn't know what was going to take place. Well, the next thing you know, they come back and this time they're not going to be stopped. He tried, tried to stop them, was unsuccessful. And as a matter of fact, they then grabbed him and were going to kill him. His teenage daughter came forward and begged for his life, and his pensioner soldiers said he was a good man. Don't do that to him. In the end, his teenage daughter was given a wine glass filled with her father's blood, and they told her that if he, she would drink it, he would go free. So she did. They both went free. He is later executed uh, during the revolution. At any rate, the crowd has their weapons. So everybody starts, and they're heading back to their home. They even had a few cannons. No gunpowder, but they, well, on the way home, here's the map showing the direction. There's the Envolide. There we go down here, and then they're going up this direction. And they go by the Bastille. Of course, the Bastille is a place that everybody believes is full of regular, normal people who've been arrested under a letter to cachet. It's a symbol of oppression of the people. So they decide to attack it. It's also loaded with gunpowder. So they begin attacking it. And this goes on most of the day. And there's several of these portraits of the location. If you're looking for the location today, the Bastille Opera House is built over the old foundation. Ultimately, later on in the afternoon, after much fighting, a detachment of regular French troops. Now you say, how do you tell the difference? The regular French troops have blue and white. The Swiss guards are all white. Well, they came in. They had a couple of small cannons. They simply hesitated for a moment, and the next thing you know, they switched sides. They joined the crowd. Now, the Bastille is commanded by Monsieur de Launay. He had 32 Swiss guards and 82 members of an invalid unit. They were negotiating back and forth and back and forth. Now, this man is, is the complete opposite of Sombrell at the Envolide. He is despised. After fighting for a while, and of course then the troops switching sides, ultimately negotiations came in and the commander surrendered the garrison if he was guaranteed safe conduct. And they tried really hard. They surrounded him with the leaders of the group that was attacking the Bastille. And those people that hated him so much, they pulled those guys away and then tore him apart. Cut his head off, put it on a pike, and ran through the city with it. In all, there were 88 wounded in the attackers. There were 83 killed. The defenders lost one man, and then the uh, Swiss guards were executed immediately afterwards uh, with the death of Launay, and then the people took over the Bastille. This is on July the 14th. Here's a model of the entire fortification. And then if you look at this cutaway view here, I want you to notice the writing. That's stone walls 30 feet thick, 100 feet high, surrounded by an 80-foot moat. Yeah, that's, that's great. But... How many people were in here when they stormed the Bastille? They thought it was full of people. They even thought the man in the Iron Mask was still there. In the end, they found only seven people who were inmates, four men who were forgers. 
been forging documents, forging checks, what have you. Two lunatics, two crazy people, an account being held at his family's request. Well, they let everybody go. And they they looked everywhere. They spent a couple of weeks looking through every nook and cranny for the, for the man in the iron mask. Didn't find him. Now, here's the sad thing. Our four forger friends, well, they released them. And by the middle of the afternoon, they all four had been rearrested for forging. But this is this tremendous example of of the enemy. I mean, this is, oh, this is where all the oppression is. This is the most oppressive place. And yet there's hardly anybody in it. Well, once this thing falls, everybody in Paris claims that they were there. And they thought they were special. And ultimately, later on, the government will just say, okay, if you can prove that you were there, you need at least two people to be able to identify that you were there or some documentation or something, then they would agree to award you. Well, as you can see at the bottom, it's a little hard to see this, but there were only 662 people who were able to guarantee that they were participants. It may not have been a giant cast of thousands. And the people were rated according to what job they did. So you see carpenters, you notice there are 41 locksmiths. Now, if you're going to attack prison, you need a locksmith. And so we have the monumental masons, you have dressmakers, you have transportation people. You even have, I believe there's a teacher. Yes, there's one teacher who was there. I don't think he brought his class, perhaps. There were there, no smugglers were found, shopkeepers. And then you have the National Guard troops that switch sides, which here is like 77 people. So they kept track of all those because they wanted to give them an award. The next thing is they decided to tear it down. And this is the architect, Monsieur Halloy, whose job it was to tear it apart. They demanded that a block be created from, from the Bastille and that it would be carved into another little Bastille. And there's there's the example of it. This is in the museum, the Carvalet. And they, one of these was then carved and sent to every hotel de ville or at every city hall in every district or department in France. And to show you how they are, that's the, that's just an exterior. They have the interior here. You can see all of the divisions. They're quite quite nice. Here are some of the ropes that were used by the people to try and climb up the walls. And our friend, the architect. He decided that he would sell souvenirs. Poloy would give you this piece of paper with his wax seal and his signature guaranteeing that that piece of stone came from the Bastille. Here's an example where the, his seal is on it, and then you have the piece of paper, a different type of piece of paper. It's kind of like collecting pieces of the Berlin Wall. Well, the National Assembly didn't think that was a very good deal, that individuals should not be making a profit, so they made him give up his money. Here's some of the keys from the various cells in the Bastille. And then if you were authenticated, this is what the government gave you. They gave you a pocket knife. They supposedly gave him a sword, but none of those survive. You have a charm, you have a medal, and you have this other necklace device. So you could walk around and show everybody how really neat you were, that you really participated. I was surprised that when the uh, bicentennial of the fall of the Bastille, that there wasn't a like a rush of people coming forward with their relatives souvenirs and it really did not take place now the problem with with this is now everybody is armed we have armed armed third estate people in paris so we need to figure out how to organize them this is the marquis de lafayette the nobleman that every american loved and the only nobleman you could trust in france because of his working with george washington so they put him in charge of what's called now the national guard which are all the people who have armed themselves and then here is the saber. This is his dress sword. And this is the, they made, I think, 100 copies of this for National Guard officers. Okay, it's time for the artifacts. Now, we knocked the Bastille off, and while everybody's resting and looting the place and looking for the man with the iron mask, let me show you the two things that I have associated with the Bastille. I'll talk about them briefly and then give you a close-up of them. This is a National Guard officer sword. And we'll get a little closer look of that. Those were copied after uh, the Marquis de Lafayette's personal sword. The other thing, this is a replica of the main key to open the Bastille Gate. The original is in Mount Vernon because it was given to George Washington by the Marquis de Lafayette. So now we'll look at a couple of close-ups of this, and then we'll be back to figuring out what the French are doing in 1789. 38 inches long, so it's really kind of hard to get a close-up of it and see everything. 
Frequently, this is referred to as a Napoleonic court sort. But when I was at the Museum de Carvalet, which is the main museum in Paris, which houses the material for the French Revolution, they have the Marquis de Lafayette's personal sword. This is an exact replica of it. And when I was there a couple of years ago, I talked to them and showed them pictures. They thought it was one of the replicas made for the first 100 officers. But some other people have said it's something else. So I think it's nice. It certainly is close as an ebony handle. And then you go down the blade. And the blade has revolutionary emblems on it that are etched into it rather than Napoleonic eagles. So it's a nice little sword. It's a dress sword. You're not going to, if, you're, if you kill somebody with this, it's because they fell on it just perfectly. At any rate, after this, we're going to go and finish up with 1789 and see what the French are doing before we move on to Unit 3. If you watch The Tale of Two Cities, I don't care what version of it. I like the old black and white one. Of course, you got the cast of thousands. You've got all the third estate people look particularly scrubby and what have you. But you see lots of women, the citizenesses that they will be called. Jacques-Louis David, the portrait painter of the Revolution and of the Napoleonic era, was commissioned to paint a participatory art piece. Now, this is the neoclassic period of art in Europe at this time. So he painted this. It's it's the scene showing the Sabine men attacking Rome to get their women back. And in the middle of it, you see the women trying to separate the two sides. In the old legend, the Romans couldn't get people to marry them, so they went out to the closest tribe, the Sabines, and stole all their women. It's called the Rape of the Sabines. The men then came to get them. The women tried to stop the fighting, probably a painting of the, of, of the earliest Stockholm Syndrome. But the importance of this is very simple. The woman in the middle, separating the two sides, represents what, what the French revolutionaries would say is the ultimate citizeness. Women can be important. You can be crucial in creating the new state. Now, you see a lot of women in insurrection type stuff because in the old days, the French government allowed women, when you had high inflation, to, to riot in the marketplaces. They would just back off the troops and let them riot. So the more women you had in your group of rioters, the less likely the police were to do anything. Now, when this painting was in this, these these figures are life-size. The original is in the Louvre. Here's Sherry in the Louvre. I was disappointed. Uh, they had they had it originally displayed on the Bicentennial the way it was originally set. There was a bronze mirror that stood in front of this. And the men were supposed to look at it as I'm looking at the picture. The women were supposed to use the mirror. And it was set so that you replaced the woman in the painting. And that's how you use what I call participatory art. As the women were successful in creating the alliance between the Sabines and the Romans, so a French woman can have this important feature with the new revolution. Now, you have to be careful. I put this one up here to show you. Here's Here's one of, the, one of the more famous paintings of the French Revolution. It's just the wrong revolution. This is the revolution of 1848. This is Les Miserables. This is not the regular French Revolution. It's kind of a cautionary tale, not to uh, the system, but to the U.S. Post Office. For the Bicentennial, somebody decided that this was the painting they were going to put on a stamp. And you can see the busts are open on Lady Liberty. Well, I didn't like that. I thought that would be troublesome. So somebody then airbrushed them and covered them. Well, this is a very famous painting. You can't do that. So it stirred up a real ruckus. So they ultimately then put it back to regular, and then that artist then put a little extra pink on the nipples, and so ultimately it was used as a expensive airmail stamp. Of course, this storming of the Bastille is the equivalent of the 4th of July in the United States history. So July the 14th is their day. Here is a game that was created so that you could play storming the Bastille during the revolution. They did all kinds of stuff. The people in France believed that what they were doing was so important that it would be remembered for eternity. So they made all sorts of games. They made all sorts of souvenirs. They collected stuff. They gathered stuff. Now, most of the Bastille, and it's torn completely down, they made a bridge out of it. And that's the bridge of the Place de la Concorde Bridge. I believe they even sent George Washington a, a block. I don't think it was one of them that was... Uh, carved but so anyway you have the storming of the bastille so this now puts 
the government in a completely different light. After the fall of the Bastille, a lot of times people just basically run through a little stuff and then head to the reign of terror. But actually, after the Bastille falls, 1789 to 91, there's a lot of work that's done. You'll notice here some very simple things. The king accepts the tricolor cockade. Jean Belly becoming the mayor of Paris. The Marquis de Lafayette is put in charge of the National Guard. And we have the great fear. And this is in the countryside. The countryside doesn't know what's going on. And so there's panic. Some people are asking the British to come in and take them over. Some people are looting and burning things. They're attacking noble property. It's really a mess while they're trying to figure out what's going on. On August the 4th, our National Assembly now starts doing some real work. Decrees equality of taxation, abolishes all those feudal rights and privileges, and the end of buying offices. On the 23rd, they decree freedom of religion. 24th, freedom of the press. 27th, the declaration of the rights of man. The women are mad because they thought it should have been men and women. But eventually, the leader of the women, Olympia de Gauge, will produce a declaration of the rights of the women, which are the same thing except with the word women. The men would say, well, you know, man is a universal meaning of mankind. Well, the women didn't buy it. Then on October 5th to the 6th, Paris mob of mostly women and children went out to Versailles and brought Louis the Sixteenth and the family back to Paris. Now, this is an important move as far as revolution is concerned because the king now is surrounded by the people. He still has bodyguards, but it's not the same thing. So it gets a little tense here. Now, in order to stabilize the government, nationalizes church property. Now, this is owned property outside the church itself, the parsonage where the pastor lives, the nunnery building, the monastery. It's the thousands of acres of extra land and businesses that they owned that was nationalized. And what they did was they estimated the value of that land, then printed money equal to that. So the assignats, which are issued on December the 19th, are based on that amount. So it had good, solid backing. Unfortunately, it's not going to stay that way. As the revolution goes along, they turn the printing press on and it becomes so worthless that sheets of it were used for wallpaper. And you can see there's government reorganization. So in 1789, there's a lot being done. And part of that stuff going on by the 23rd to the 27th also dealt with how to make it equal, equal execution. And this is going to lead to the creation of the guillotine. But that's next time. Here's a chart showing the areas of the of the fear. And you see the red dots, the cities? That's where the revolution is popular. This is an urban movement initially. That You have various groups. There's Toulon down here in the bottom, where the French Navy is. They invite the British to come in and take them over. There's areas uh, around the old Guienne. So it's it's not like, oh boy, we really love this. It, it takes a little while to settle in. This is a different map showing the, the same thing, areas where the great fear took place, which is the purple, and then the areas where you have actually a revolt against the new government. And some of those revolts will not be put down until the Napoleonic era, until Napoleon is, is first consul. If you're keeping track of governments, I usually ask my students to keep track of the government so you see how many changes there are. In 1789 alone, there are three governments, the king from June to May, king and the the States General made a June, and then the National Assembly. And you see the three groups of people that are the political parties, the Patriots, the Royalists, and the Jacobins. The Royalists are in favor of a strong king. Jacobins want to get rid of the king. And the Patriots would like a middle-of-the-road view. There's the, if you're looking for a definition of what a constituent assembly is, it's a body that was made from the National Assembly that was ultimately responsible for the governing of France and creating a constitution for the new state. This will ultimately provide a constitution, but it will not be until 1791. So this form of government will last until 1791. And here's what made up the, the Royalist Party, the Monarchians. Admirers of the English Constitution who wanted a bicameral legislature and an absolute royal veto on legislation. So he would, they would want it so that if he didn't like it, it didn't happen. There was no voting overturning the veto like you have in the United States. But uh, they're overwhelmingly going to be <laughs> passed over. And then we have the Jacobins, founded in 1789, originally known as the Breton Club, moved to Paris. They get the name because they met in a Jacobin convent. 
Uh, and uh, Jacobi, Jacobins had also meant an order of Dominicans. He controlled the countryside through hundreds of little aso social societies interested in extreme changes and had several factions. It's responsible for the reign of terror, overthrown in 1794 the, the coup de thermidor known as the Thermidorian Reaction, officially suppressed by the Directory in 1794. And its symbol is this Phrygian cap of liberty with the uh, cockade on it. And there's the Declaration of the Rights of Man, just a general description of it, a document which gives the rights of all French citizens under liberty, equality, and fraternity. The motto of the Republic, liberty, equality, and fraternity. With you, when you have the declaration, this is this is what it, it supports. I think there are 17 parts to the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen: rule of law, equal citizenship, collective sovereignty of the people. They gave you freedom of liberty, freedom to do anything that doesn't injure others. Man is determined as to be an abstract to include all sexes, races, and nationalities. When it was passed, they put these giant posters out. One of the original posters showing all of the different rights and the Declaration of the Rights of Man. And you can find that very easily online. And then between 1789 and 91, this is what the government factions will be. Our constitutional royalists, the moderates will be known as the Girondin, and then the mountain will be the extremists. And under that situation, the royalists are basically trying to keep the king, but now they want a limited power. We see originally they wanted a strong veto. Now they want a weak veto. But Louis XVI is going to ruin that. And that's what you see in the Flight of Varin, which is our next segment. Our Girondin, which is the middle class, made up of people from the southwest part of France, from the Gironde, supported limited constitutional monarchy. Okay, They supported a war with Britain, Holland, Spain. <laughs> the reason they're supporting a war is, look at the situation in Europe. The French had the most powerful king in all of Europe. If the people are able to overthrow Louis XVI and replace it with another form of government, no king is safe throughout Europe. So the European, the governments and the major powers cannot allow the French Revolution to be successful. And the same is true when Napoleon comes in. Napoleon is a completion of the French Revolution. They can't let him be successful either. Those seven wars of the coalition, part of them are fought against the revolutionary time period. The rest of them are fought against Napoleon. But in essence, their conservative reactions to this liberal, liberal movement of allowing people to vote and removing your king. And you'll notice the Girondin will disappear during the reign of terror. And then our Montagnards, or the extremists in the Jacobin group, got their name from the they're called the city in the mountain. The chamber of the assembly goes up. And so the, they sat in the way in the back and told people how they were supposed to vote. Robespierre, Danton, Hébert, Marat, and eventually these guys are all going to fight amongst each other. Um, Marat's going to be murdered in his bathtub. Hébert will have been executed. Danton and Robespierre will then battle it out. Danton will lose. And then finally the moderates will come back. So where we go from here, part three of the French Revolution will take us from 1790 until the flight to Varennes, when the when Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette try to flee the country. It is that event that throws the revolution into the hands of the radicals. So I hope you enjoyed what we did today. We'll see you next time. Thank you very much.